Welcome to Manna for Breakfast, the daily Bible reading devotional which chronologically takes you through the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation in one year. Grab a cup of coffee and your Bible and join us as we journey together through God's Word. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm coming to you again from the conference center. Today is the last day of the conference. I'm pre-recording this because there's a lot to do. We have worship this morning and a lot of things. Uh, Renee taught last night, did a great job. Women have very, been very engaged in the worship, very attentive to the teaching. Uh, I consider that an answer to prayer. I think it's pretty amazing. These are some very, very nice and very um, loving women we've been meeting. Uh, it's been nice, it's been a very nice time. We're enjoying ourselves. It being a, one of the few times where the whole uh, body of um, Christ could come down, at least from our church, spend time together in the Word. Let me clean up this. I've got one little thing here I don't need. Let me get rid of that one. There we go. That looks a little better, huh? Okay, we are in t- <laughs> Genesis 25, 26, as you saw double there. Two times, you guys that are live anyway. And uh, let's go ahead and pray and get into the Word this morning. Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters that are are here. Thank you for bringing new people in. And we do love you. We thank you for this time that we get to spend with you. And thank you for the work you're doing here at the conference. In Cruz de Wanacaxli, just to our South God of Bayarda, thank you for blessing these ladies and everything you're doing at this conference. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Genesis 25. Now Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore to him Zimram and Jokshan and Midan and and, uh, Midian and Ishbak and Shua. Jokshan became the father of Sheba and Dedan. The sons of Dedan was Asherim and Lethushim and Lumim. The sons of Midian were Ephah and Ephor, and Hanak, and Abida, and Elda. These, all these were the sons of Keturah. Now, Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but to the, the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living, and sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the land of the east. These are all the years of Abraham's life that he lived 175 years, Abraham breathed his last and died in a ripe old age, an old man, and satisfied with life. He And he was gathered to his people. Then his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the sons of Zoar, the Hittite, facing Mamre, the field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth. There Abraham was buried with Sarah, his wife. It came about after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac lived in Berlairoi. Now, these are the records of the generations of Ishmael. Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian Sarah's maid, bore to Abraham. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names in the order of their birth. Abayoth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kedar, and Adbel, and Mibsham, and Shima, and Duma, and Masa, Hadad, and Tema, Jeter, Nephish, and Kedema. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages and by their camps. Twelve princes, according to their tribes. These are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last and died, and was gathered to his people. They settled from Havilah to Shur, which is east of Egypt. As one goes towards Assyria, he settled in defiance of all his relatives. Now these are the records of the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padam Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren, and the Lord answered him with Rebekah, his wife, 
and I'm sorry, and the Lord answered him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it is so, why then am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will be separated from your body. And one people should be stronger than the other. And the older shall serve the younger. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came forth red all over like a hairy garment. And they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came forth with his hand holding on to Esau's heels. So they named his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter and man of the field. But Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. Now Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. While Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field and was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, Please let me have a swallow of the red stuff there, for I am famished. Therefore his name is called Edom. But Jacob said, First, show me your birthright. Esau said, Behold, I am about to die. So of what use then is the birthright to me? And Jacob said, First, swear to me. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, there was a famine in the land beside the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. The Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt, stay in the land for which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. I will multiply your descendants and the stars of heaven, and I will give your descendants all these lands. And by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, my laws. So Isaac lived in Gerar. When the men of the place asked about his wife, he said, She is my sister. But he was afraid to say, My wife, thinking the men of the place might kill me on account of Rebekah, for she is beautiful. It came about when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out through the window, or a window, and saw, and behold, Isaac was caressing his wife, Rebekah. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, certainly she is your wife. How then did you say she is my sister? And Isaac said to him, Because I, I said I might die in the account of her. Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might have easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech charged all the people, saying, You who touches this man, or his wife shall surely be put to death. Now Isaac sowed in that land and reaped the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him, and the man became rich, and continued to grow richer until he became very wealthy, for he had possessions of flocks and herds, and a, and a great household, so that the Philistines envied him. Now all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines stopped up by filling them with earth. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are too powerful for us. And Isaac departed from there and camped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. Then Isaac dug again wells of water, which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the same names which his father had given them. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of flowing water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with the herdsmen of Isaac, saying, The water is ours. So he named that well Isaac, because they continued with him. They contended with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over it too. So he named it Sitna. And he moved away from there and dug another well. And they did not quarrel over it. So he named it Rehoboth. For he said, At last the Lord has made room for us, and we will be faithful in the land. Then he went up from there to Beersheba. The Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. So he built an altar there, called upon the name of the Lord, pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. 
Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar with his advisor, Ahuzath, and Pichol, the commander of his army. And Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me since you hate me and have sent me away from you? They said, We see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, Let there now be an oath between us, even between you and us. Let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm, just as we have not touched you and have done to you nothing but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. Then he made them a feast, and they ate and drank. And in the morning they arose early and exchanged oaths, and Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. That came about on the same day that Isaac's servants came in, told him about the well which they had dug, and he said to him, We have found water. So he called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day, where Esau was. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Beri, the Hittite, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. <laughs> well, that's an interesting way to uh, end that chapter. Uh, polygamy does bring grief. We see that over and over. It sounds like a good idea. Of course, these guys wanted to do it to grow the nation, and God seemed to allow it, but it doesn't mean that it went easy. In fact, we see that pretty much nothing they did was was easy. And even if it was God's plan, think about um, Rebecca. She is the type, or or she models the same obedience and faith that Abraham had, where she goes by a word of the Lord. And overnight, she said, you're called. I want you to go to this land, marry this guy, and become a part of me growing this nation. And she says, okay, just like overnight, I'll do it. And then she gets there, marries him. And the, of course, they pray for her to have a overwhelming amount of children and that she would be this great woman that would bring all of these children to Isaac and, and the, the promise to Abraham would be fulfilled through her in, in a very real sense. And guess what? She's barren. She can't have kids. What? God, <laughs> did he make a mistake? No. She was barren for his purpose and his glory so that we see that Isaac has to pray, that Isaac has to learn faith, that Isaac has to learn that it's going to be God that brings these other kids into the world, not him. He's not going to be like the solution to Abraham's problem. Every step of the way, it's God. And then he takes his wife, go down to this Abimelech, and we find out that he lies. He does the same thing his father did. He's worried about his life. He's not walking in the spirit. He's not a great man of faith at this point in his life. And, and we see that God uses his mistakes. They, they're supposed to stay in the land and grow, but guess what? God brings up in them. So every time we think that if God's blessing is always upon us, you know, get that once we're in his will, everything's just going to always get better and better and better. Oftentimes when we're in his will, things will get worse and worse and worse so that he can get glorified in some miracle he wants to do to show the world that he's the one in charge. He's the one getting the glory. How interesting is that? And of course, they get rich, even though they're doing all the work and they're digging all these wells, they're getting all this persecution for trying to live in the land peacefully. And they keep moving away from the wells. They notice they don't go to war over them. They say, okay, move away. I'll go move away. And then when they find this other place where they can, they don't fight over the well, then now they're established and God blesses them. And we see him starting to flourish. Probably wasn't a good idea to take these other wives, but he, like Abraham, makes that mistake. Say, I'll help God out. Take, it down, take a couple of wives more as we're supposed to be a great nation and have lots of kids, but maybe didn't pray about that one. would be my guess. All right. Jumping over to Matthew 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, and unless you are converted and become like children, will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones 
who believes in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck than to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. For it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. But woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it from you. Sorry. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands and two feet and be cast into eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it far from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fire hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. What do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountain and go and search for the one that is strained? If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine which have gone astray. Which have not gone astray. Sorry. So it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on the earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Little ones here may refer to children, but many people think it refers to, to the, the little ones in faith. That it's people that are just coming to to faith and salvation and they're untaught and the enemy wants to come and snatch what they have out of their hand and want, want to try and conf confuse them and, and easily cause them, you know, cause them to fall into sin. And so if you see them in sin, you should go to them and, you know, whether they're young in faith or old and pray that the Father would help you to correct them. So, um, Either way, which other, it's both probably, uh, young children and young believers. But we know that in order to be a believer, you really have to be old enough to make a choice. You have to ask God. You have to ask the Father. It doesn't mean you have everything, everything figured out. I didn't. Man, when I was first saved, I didn't have anything figured out. I was wrong about everything, mostly. I just knew I figured out that Jesus was really died for me. And uh, I wanted him. And I needed to be forgiven. But other than that, goofy ideas on just about everything it took me years to get it straightened out. And hopefully, hopefully I've gotten it straightened out. I'm sure the Lord will show me some areas that I still have wrong, but it's interesting. Uh, anyway, let's move on. Charles Spurgeon, and there shall, and there shall ye remember your ways and all your doings, wherein ye have been defiled. And ye shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for all your evil for all your evils that ye have committed, Ezekiel 20, 43, when we are accepted of the Lord and are standing in the place of favor and peace and safety, then we are led to, to repent of all our failures and miscarriages towards our gracious God. So precious, precious is repentance that we may call it a diamond of the first water and is and this is sweetly promised to the people of God as one most sanctified result of salvation. He who accepts repentance also gives repentance, and he who gives it not only not out of the bitter box, but from among those wafers made with honey on which he feeds his people. A sense of blood-bought pardon and of undeserved mercy is the best means of dissolving a heart of stone. Are we feeling hard? Let us think of covenant love, and then we shall leave sin, lament sin, and loathe sin. Yea, 
we shall loathe ourselves for sinning against such infinite love. Let us come to God with this promise of penance and ask him to help us to remember and repent and regret and return. Oh, that we could enjoy the melting of holy sorrow. What a relief would a flood of tears be. Lord, smite the rock or speak to the rock and cause the waters to flow. Boy, I like that. That is really, really good. It's really poetic, but it is so, so good. And that was God in my life. Just the, the coming to the point of it, giving up and repenting and saying, man, all the years I spent trying to get to God my own way and my own religion by my own spirituality was all wrong. And I had to break and just say, I'm sorry, God. Why did I ever think I could make you come to me and make you bend to my will when it's clear that we must break and come to you by your means? And then you lavish upon his salvation because you went to the world, you came into the world to die for us and you did everything. So we would have no excuse and no reason not to come to you. What a great and glorious God you are. Thank you, God. And let's go ahead and pray and thank him for that and thank him for everything he is doing in the conference. Let's pray. God, we do graciously thank you for this day you've given for the conference and all that's been going on here. Thank you for all my brothers and sisters have been praying uh, for the ladies down here. May you just do a marvelous work. Continue to bless Randy and Dodie as they are um, continuing to develop this place. Thank you for the teams they just found out are going to come down, the future conferences. We put it all in your hand, God. But we put the lives of these women in your hand, that they would go home refreshed, built up, strengthened, ready to serve, ready to get serious about their walks and, and be a witness and a testimony. Continue to heal these women that need healing in their emotions, have difficulty in their marriages. Be, help them be strong and be gracious and show the love of Christ to those people around them. So thank you, Father, for a most beautiful time here. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So that'll do it, guys. Thank you so much. Please like and subscribe as you hear everybody say on YouTube because it really is a difference. I see there's sometimes there's a whole lot of people online. I might get two likes, three likes. I know you're busy. We're all bigger. But it the more likes we get, the more subscribes we get, the more people we reach. So keep that in mind. Use it as a ministry opportunity. Okay. I won't get hurt if you don't give a like. But I really just want to see the uh, I want to see this get out to more people. Okay. God bless you. We will. Let me see. Wait a minute. Yeah, I'll get an audio podcast out somehow tomorrow. So we'll see you tomorrow on the audio podcast for Manna for Breakfast. Okay. Bye-bye.